So let's start in English. Um, I will be adding people as they come, but anyway, I think we can uh, start. It's a really great pleasure to uh, see many, many faces, uh, many familiar faces. Um, I want to thank you for, uh, for joining and uh, I want to share a couple of uh, words as intro. Uh, first of all, I wanted to tell you that uh, this event has been um, organized on the uh, World uh, Art Day, which is today, uh, to kick off the campaign that uh, Foundation 787 is uh, implementing with uh, Jeanne Beha. Um, uh, it's called uh, Women in Creative Industry in Bosnia and Herzegovina, where we actually want to raise with it uh, activities within creative industry uh, in our country. We want to also promote work of some amazing women that some of them also joined us today. Um, and we also want to supply individuals uh, with, uh, within this field uh, with um, know-how, with some uh, relevant content that could help you out uh, in your work. Um, this is why we are implementing this webinar mainly uh, to share the knowledge. Uh, the webinar is implemented with the support of a Swiss entrepreneurship program. Um, and uh, we are very happy to have uh, David uh, today with us, um, uh, who will talk about profitable pricing in a creative industry. However, uh, we see that the topic is relevant for other uh, industries and fields as well. However, uh, a lot of examples will actually be focused on the creative industry. Um, David is international speaker, trainer, uh, entrepreneur, business consultant, author of uh, well, uh, who is specialized for the field of creative industry and uh, creative uh, entrepreneurship. Um, he really worked with great tools uh, in over uh, uh, 50 countries around the world. Uh, so sorry. Um, so he has really uh, extensive experience in this field. Um, and before I hand it over to David, I want to share a couple of, um, let's say, uh, house rules. Um, so first of all, the webinar will uh, last for an hour and a half. We have a three section under this topic. So after each section, we will take a couple of uh, questions about that part. And in the end, we can have uh, like a general uh, Q&A. Um, also, after one and a half hours, if there are still some questions, there will be an unofficial hangout. Uh, David kindly offered that he could stay for uh, some time more uh, so you can ask um, everything that's on your mind related to the topic. Um, third thing is that we will, if we didn't start, which I think we didn't, we will be recording um, actually we did, um, sorry for that. Uh, we will be recording this uh, session and make it available uh, uh, later. Uh, regarding the technical part, uh, you will all be muted uh, unless you are speaking and uh, during the Q&A session, you can, um, you can um, raise hand or you can uh, join uh, uh, yourself. Uh, but in the meantime, while David is speaking or somebody else is speaking, you can always write a, a question in a chat and we will follow it and try to answer all of your questions. So I think that's all about uh, house rules um, and uh, what we are doing today. So I'm uh, handing over to David to kick this webinar off. Well, uh, hello, everybody. I'm delighted to be working with you today, and I'm thrilled to be working in partnership with Swiss EP and Foundation 787. It's a real honor to come together to, uh, to work in partnership to provide this um, webinar. So I'm really looking forward to it. And as Diana has said, uh, it's gonna be as interactive as possible. I'll be making presentations, but after each section, we will take questions and I'm looking forward to hearing from you with your experience, with your questions and your stories and to continue that dialogue after the official event because I can chat a bit longer and you can contact me through my website, which is uh, here 
uh, davidparish.com and you can also use that link to to check me out so um, let's begin and I'm going to share the screen um, So I've prepared a presentation and I'll be talking through it. Um, I can share the presentation with you afterwards. It's mainly just some bullet points and text. So I'll be using the presentation at some stages like now, um, but at other points, I'll switch off the screen sharing so that I can talk to you more personally, more directly, and you can, um, we can talk face to face. So, the overview of today's web webinar about three dimensions of profitable pricing is to look at pricing in three ways. And the first one is pricing in relation to costs and profit. Um, so that's the economic side of pricing, and we can talk about that. Secondly, pricing in relation to customer perceptions and your position in the market. So this is about a little bit more about the psychology of pricing, how prices are perceived and what the effect of pricing is. And then thirdly, pricing for benefits, options and intellectual property. In other words, pricing the more complete bundle, how we can add value to our goods and services and therefore charge more by adding extra things that the customer might want. So, that's the overview, and I'm going to get started straight away, moving into section one. And the first part um, about pricing in relation to costs and profits is to ca uh, calculate the direct costs. Now, so the direct costs are the obvious ones. For example, I might be talking with somebody who works in arts and crafts, let's say a jeweler, and he or she will tell me that um, the parts of the jewelry, the gold and the diamond, or the, the stone, for example, might be uh, 500 euros. And they tell me then that the, because the parts are 500 euros, and they sell the, the ring or the earrings for 1,000 euros, then they make a profit of 500 euros. In other words, the materials are 500, that's very clear. They sell uh, the finished product for 1,000, and so they make a profit. Is that true? Uh, well, the answer is yes and no. We could describe that as the gross profit, the difference between the raw materials, the elements, and the finished price. But clearly, there are other things that we need to take into account. And this is where it becomes a bit more complicated. But yes, it is important, nevertheless, to understand the direct costs, the cost of the raw materials in, in a product, or um, the, shall we say, the obvious costs when we're dealing with a service. Um, now, let me go back and but the second one is about the cost of time, because my next question to the jeweler will be, okay, how long did it take you to make this pair of earrings? And then she might say, well, it took 10 hours, for example. And I ask, what is the cost of those 10 hours? And this is less clear. But I might say, if you were working for me, if I was your boss and you were making the jewellery, how much would you expect to be paid per hour? So they might say, just to think of a number, 50 euros per hour, please. So if they are charging their labor at 50 euros per hour and they took 10 hours to make this product, 
then that's 500 euros of labor that goes into it. So now we have the raw materials of 500 euros. Uh, we sell it for a thousand thinking we're making a profit. Now that profit is taken up by the 500 euros of labor. So we do need to understand how much time we're putting into each product, each service uh, or each project. The cost of time is a real cost that we need to calculate when we're setting the prices. This is important. And I'm not saying that you should record every single minute that you, uh, that you work on a project, but I think we should record in the most accurate way possible, or at least approximately, so that we have some idea how long each project takes in terms of our labor and indeed our colleagues labor. So this is a second element of the, the costs that we need to take into account when we're fixing the price. But it becomes a bit more complicated because I say to then to the jeweler, um, or ask the question, and I have to say, as a consultant, I get the easy job. I just ask the questions. And it's the, the more difficult thing is for the client to answer them. I ask what other costs are involved in making this product? And they say, well, it's just the raw materials and my labor. But then I say, what about the cost of your studio? What about the cost of uh, your mobile phone? What about the cost of your website? your software, your computer, your stationery, everything that else that is taken, um, taken up in running the business. These are, shall we say, <clears throat> sometimes called the fixed costs or the overheads of the business. In other words, the costs that we have to pay just to be in business. And it might be rent, computer, um, stationary, travel, all these things that are necessary. And we need to understand the cost of those. So I urge you to understand those costs, to count those costs. And this might be done, for example, on an annual basis. You might say for the year, um, all these extra costs uh, for rent, phones, travel, insurance, etc. they are, let's think of a number, 20,000 euros. So we need to understand that. We need to build that in somehow. Now, how do we connect the 20,000 euros per year with a particular product? And the answer is, let's say this uh, jeweler makes 200 products a year, just to use a simple number. Each of those products has to pay some of the cost of that overhead. Some of that overhead of 20,000 euros per year has to be allocated to each product. And so dividing, uh, let's 100 products by 20,000, that's 200, pound, 200 pounds or euros of overhead per product. So that has to be borne into the cost. So now where are we? We think we're making a profit selling the earrings for 1,000 euros, but the costs are 500 euros for the raw materials, 500 euros for labor in each product, and we have to allocate 200 euros of our overheads to each product. So now that is 1,200 pounds, sorry. I keep saying pounds, which is my currency, but euros or, or any currency, dollars, whatever. I'll, state, I'll try to stick to euros. So now we're selling for 1,000 euros, but actually our true costs are 1,200 euros. So we're making a loss of 200 euros every time we sell a product, which guys is not clever. It's not a good idea. 
So this is one way to work out your break-even cost. This is to say um, the minimum we should charge just to break even so we don't make a loss is 1200 euros. And then we're not losing money. That is really important to know, but that is not necessarily the price we charge. It's the minimum price we should charge to make sure we don't make a loss. But of course we can charge more than that. And we'll come on to that later. But at this point, we're doing the maths. We're doing the sums to understand what are the true costs so that we can find a minimum or a break even cost to charge. And then finally, uh, on this section, one more thing to take into account is the distributors and retailers profit margins. Because sometimes we might be um, not selling direct to the customer, but we might be selling to a retailer, a shop, or to a distribution channel, and then they sell to the end user. So we need to take into account the, um, the profit that they need to make. Let me give you a simple story, which is in my book, my marketing book, which I'll mention later as well. This is about a woman in England I was advising and she made wedding dresses and she sold them occasionally direct to uh, the bride, but the, she then started working with a shop and let's say her wedding dresses were 3000 euros. And she said to the shop, um, if you sell my dress, you can take 20% of that. So, um, what did I say? 3,000 euros. Um, they take 20%, that's 600 is their profit. And she makes 2,400. But what happened is 20% is not very much for the retailer. And so they didn't promote her dresses. They were in the shop, but right at the back of the shop because the retailer understood they didn't make much profit from her dresses. So she didn't sell any. So then she came to me and we discussed it and we said, let's give the retailer a bigger profit margin. Instead of selling the dress for 3000 euros, let's sell it for 4000 euros and give the retailer not 20%, but 30% of the retail price. So now the retailer is making 1200 pounds if my numbers add up. So it's now more attractive for the retailer to sell her dresses. And what happened is the retailer put her dresses in the shop window and she sold more because now she was building into the price, not only the cost to her and the profit for her, but also taking into account how to incentivize the retailer so that they sold her products um, and promoted them. The retailer made more money, but then so did she. So this is another dimension when we're looking at pricing in relation to costs and profit. And so at this point, um, I'll stop the screen sharing. And that's the end of, of a brief presentation on section one. And maybe we can spend a few moments now to get your feedback, uh, to, to understand whether that was useful, whether that made sense, whether I need to clarify anything or indeed whether you've got any questions specifically relating to this section. Mm -hmm. So guys, um, are there any questions you can write in chat or you can unmute yourself and ask the question? Um, for me, maybe I can use the, the opportunity to ask from this, uh, let's say, very economic side. Um, when we are uh, selling, let's say, a spectrum of um, of products that are similar or whatever, and uh, we are using some of the materials, the same materials and some different materials, and then we are having different uh, um, um, different costs that are, are that are changeable, etc. Uh, how in this situation? Because when we have one product or one service it's quite easy to, to calculate if we even have a formula, um, you know, to calculate the break-even point, et cetera. But when we are having 
a couple of program, uh, products or dozens of them, how to, to redistribute that margin between them, how to uh, decide on a price in, in that sense. Okay. Well, um, I think what many people do, uh, and it's a starting point, is to say, in our studio, we make all kinds of jewelry, different kinds, earrings, bracelets, etc. And we have lots of raw materials that are used for all of them. So we can start by saying our total uh, sales um, are so much, our total costs are so much. And, you know, we need to make sure that they balance. So in other words, we can lump everything together as if it's one big product. Now, that's a starting point. And even at that point, we can see whether we're fully taking to, into account overheads um, or um, the labor costs. Now, and that's useful and that guides us. And probably what happens at that point is that you decide you have to increase your costs. Your, sorry, increase your prices. This is often the conclusion when we start looking in any way at the real costs. And this is what I do as a consultant with people. We look at the costs and even by doing some rough and ready figures, we come to the conclusion we need to increase prices. So that's a starting point. It's a very crude and rough way to do it, but it's useful. But then we say, actually, <clears throat> you know, not every item is equal um, because we know from experience that making earrings takes three times as long as making a bracelet. It's just more complex. And we, we know that it takes more time. So then we start to become a little bit more sophisticated. And we might split our products into those that take a lot of time and those that are very quick. And we can price accordingly because we realize all the labor is going into the complex ones. And so we start to become step by step a little bit more complex and sophisticated in the way we price things. We might say that some of our jewelry uh, just uses cheap stones, but a few items of jewelry use real diamonds, which are more expensive. So surely we shouldn't include those in the same way as everything else. Maybe we need to look at the pricing of those a little bit differently. And so step by step, we become a bit more sophisticated in how we understand the costs that go into each product. Those that take a lot of time versus those that don't, those that have expensive uh, raw, raw materials versus those that don't. And so we then say, well, we really, we need to look at our business now in three sections. We're still combining lots of things, but we're dividing it into three departments. And we need to look, understand the costs for each department, for labor and raw materials, and then we start to come to conclusions about the prices. And clearly we're gonna charge more for those that include diamonds, and we're gonna to have to charge more for those that take a lot of time to produce. And so we can start in a very simple, crude way, and step by step become more sophisticated um, as far as it's useful. So I'm not saying that you should measure every single one of the 300 items that you buy and every single minute of the work you do, that will be far too complex. We start with simple, which is not good enough, and we start and then we become more sophisticated as it, you know, because it's useful, um, but we don't get carried away. And even that will help us to make much more intelligent uh, decisions about pricing to make sure we don't lose money. Um, so I think that's the practical approach I would take. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one more uh, question, which actually also relates for the uh, uh, second part. Uh, it can use it can be used for the introduction in a way. The question comes from Selma, and it is how to make a balance between calculating price, uh, taking into account all uh, these mentioned points, and being competitive at the market. Yeah. Okay. That's. Um... That does come into very nicely into the second section because this is about marketing um, and so I will I will address that as I go through the next section. If I don't specifically address it, then you can you can nudge me and uh, remind me 
and I'll come back to it. I think it will be covered. So let's move on to the next section and I'll go back to my screen sharing. Um, and yeah, now we come on to um, pricing, perceptions and positioning. This is looking at it from the customer's point of view. So previously we, we looked at the business from our own personal point of view or within the business. This is internal stuff about our costs. Now we have to look at pricing uh, and value from the customer's point of view. And I would say it's a pretty good definition of marketing actually is to look at things from the customer's point of view. It's certainly an essential part of marketing to look at things from the customer's point of view. And so some customers might say, um, wow, beautiful jewelry, but it's far too expensive. I can't afford it. Other customers might say, wow, that's amazing jewelry, but I don't understand why it's so cheap. I don't trust it. It can't really be true to be so cheap. So customers have a view about prices as well. This is, shall we say, the psychology of pricing. And to understand customers, we need to talk to them. We need to listen to them and understand what they think. But I would also suggest that you observe yourself because you are a customer as well. Why did you pay so much money for the spectacles that you're wearing? Why did I pay more money for this shirt I'm wearing? Because it has a brand. You know, why do we sometimes buy the very cheapest things, maybe like baked beans in the supermarket, but other times we pay far more than we need to because we want to, because we're, we're buying something else. So we need to look at things from the customer's point of view. And this is where it gets more interesting. And in order to do this, we need to choose the right customers. A strong point I make in my marketing book is that marketing isn't about trying to sell to everybody. This is what many businesses do. They, they spend their time on the product and then they think, oh, I need some customers. And then they just start sending out tweets and posts and leaflets and messages and advertising everywhere in the hope that somehow some, somebody will become a customer. But actually, we need to be more strategic about marketing. We need to find the right customers. Um, and this is the challenge. This is the strategy. This is the clever way to do it, not to try to sell to everybody, but to find the right customers who do value what we make and what we offer and focus on those. And this comes back to answering that question. Very often I um, have a conversation with somebody in business and I say, you need to increase your prices because you're not accounting for overheads. You're not accounting for the uh, in, indirect costs and um, your labor. And we then calculate that the price has to be maybe even twice as much. And their first reaction then is to say, oh my goodness, people round here, people round here won't pay that money. They won't pay that. And my answer is, well, in that case, don't sell to people round here. In other words, Sometimes we have the wrong customers and we can't get out of the problem. We're in a situation where we have to sell cheap, reduce our prices and make no money, or to sell out and make something which is not truly valuable to us. And this is the position many people find themselves in. But that's because they they are fixed on a particular set of customers. And, my, and choosing the right customers, being strategic about marketing, might mean finding other customers, new customers, who are prepared to pay the proper price for what your products and services are worth. Marketing is not about convincing people who don't have money 
to pay. It isn't about convincing people who don't value you to value you. So as a marketing consultant, I get invited many times to businesses and they say, David, we have a marketing problem. I can say, okay. They say, customers won't pay enough money. My customers won't pay what I need to charge them. And they think I'm going to have some magic answer and convince the customers to pay the money. But my answer is different. And it's to say, let's find new customers. So choosing the right customers is a key element of marketing. And of course, it relates to pricing. And then we need to select a position in the market because not only are we dealing with customers, we're dealing with competitors. We have to decide where we can compete. And so sometimes we can compete by being cheaper than our rivals, because often there are other people who are doing a similar thing to you, similar products or services or projects. So how do we differentiate from them? Do we become cheaper than them? Or do we add value and do some, become the deluxe version? And so we can see this positioning uh, phenomenon happening with cars and the Volkswagen or Audi group, you know, have three different cars for three different price ranges. They have Skoda, which is the cheap end of the market. It positions itself in that market uh, for some people that some people want. And then there is Volkswagen, which is mid market and Audi, which is, you know, high market, high value, high class. So they have different positions in the car market. We could do that, but as a starting point, we have to decide whether we are the Skoda, the Volkswagen or the Audi of our industry and then price accordingly and find the right customers accordingly. And then of course, we need to be consistent about our prices. We, if we want to uh, promote ourselves as being of great value, the best in the city, or the best in the world, world-class, the most professional, we have to price accordingly. So we're gonna be expensive and that's okay. But we must be consistent about this. If we are also selling cheap products, then um, it confuses people. How can, you know, if Rolls-Royce, who sell very, very, very expensive cars, started making bicycles and selling them really cheap with the Rolls-Royce brand, it confuses people. It diminishes the brand. It's not consistent. That's not what Rolls-Royce are about. So we need to be consistent. And, and just to finish this section, let me tell you a story to illustrate it. And I was working in England with a, a woman who was making crafts and we decided she wasn't making enough money. She needed to charge more. And we decided to reposition her as being world-class. The products she was making were fantastic. And we were talking about getting lots of publicity for her so that she became uh, somebody really uh, that everybody wanted to buy from. She would appeal to rich people and they would buy from her and she would uh, reposition her business in the high class end of the market and sell very expensively and make lots of money by selling to rich people, basically. Um, and we talked about this for weeks in our weekly meetings. And then one day, um, she, I asked her on the Monday morning what she did for the weekend. She said, well, I went to a craft fair uh, at the weekend. And I said, well, I thought we agreed you weren't going to go to craft fairs and just sell to the public with these inexpensive items. That's not the strategy. She said, I know, David, I know, but uh, I was bored. I booked this thing in advance and I went along just to do something on a wet Sunday afternoon. And she said, um, it was very quiet. Not many people went, it was a rainy day, but there was a little old lady. And this little old lady came to my stall and she picked up one of the items and she said, uh, how much is this? And um, my friend said, oh, it's 20 euros. 
And the little old lady walked away very sad because she didn't have so much money. And later in the day, the little old lady came back and she said, how much is this? And my friend, my client, the businesswoman who was a kind hearted woman, she said, for you, okay, just give me five euros and you can take it. It was an act of kindness. And the little old lady was delighted and smiled and went away happy. And my friend had a warm glow in her heart at the act of kindness. But my reaction was a bit different. My reaction was, you know what? We need to find that little old lady and we need to kill her before she talks. Because if she, if she tells people that you're selling your products for five euros, it totally, totally ruins our branding, our positioning, and the messages we're trying to say about the, the world-class level of products and the very expensive pricing. Now, of course, I wasn't serious um, about killing the little old lady, but I was very serious about the point of uh, positioning because we can't do both. Otherwise, it undermines our messages, our branding. So we need to be very clear and we need to be consistent. So that's the end of the, the second section. This, by the way, is a very compressed version of a, a workshop that normally takes me all day, but uh, I'm trying to give you the highlights and the key points so that we take away something in an hour and a half. So at this point, uh, are there any, is there any feedback, any comments, questions, examples? Um, so besides of Selma's question we had earlier, um, if she has something more to add, you can write or speak up. Uh, besides that, uh, we have questions from Marco. Yep. Okay, and then we'll have Adriana who raised the hand. So let's do Marco's question first. Uh, how to calculate into per, uh, parameters of price and profit margin uh, the artistic value of the product and how to position our product at the market as such higher value product? Mm -hmm. Well, um, this is part of the... Um, it probably... I can answer it partly in the next section um, and probably I can answer it best in the next section. But I would say... Um, so far, we've looked at things from the uh, pure economic point of view. Um, so if we're talking about a work of art, let's say a painting, just to keep it simple, then um, the, the costs of the work of art are the labor, the materials, you know, the canvas and the paint, um, and then any profit, the overheads, uh, <coughs> the overheads, the labor and the direct costs and maybe something for the gallery, the, the retailer. And that gives us a minimum price. At least we're paying for the canvas. At least we're paying the artist so much per hour. But of course, when we come to art, we're dealing with something intangible. The value of art is not just the sum of canvas and paint. Art has a value far beyond that. And now, and this, is, this comes on to the second section. Some people will say, I don't like it. Some people will look at a Van Gogh painting and say, I don't like it, but I'll pay you $10 for the canvas. To them, that's all it's worth, the raw materials. But to an art collector, they might pay millions and millions of dollars because it's a Van Gogh painting. So this is how some customers get it and some customers don't. This is an extreme example of choosing the right customer. So if you find a Van Gogh painting in your, in your loft when you clear out, um, then you know, don't sell it to your next door neighbor who knows nothing about art. Don't sell it to at a, a car boot sale. You know, clearly we need to find the right customers, probably the big art galleries who understand it and are prepared to pay. So the value of art is, um, it is about what you put into it as an artist, of course, but it's also about what um, the, the customer sees and the customer's perception. And some people will pay millions of dollars um, for a piece of art. 
other people will pay nothing. So art is an intangible, the value of art, and really that comes into the next section. So let me move into the next section. And if the same question isn't uh, answered properly by then, please come back to me and I'll, I'll answer it further. Um, if I may interrupt for a moment, whether or not you raised a hand before, is it relevant for this part? Yeah, so maybe we can take one more question and then move on. Okay, you sure. can. Yeah. Hi, David. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm, I'm a gallerist and I, I'm a painter. Um, and you, you partly answered my question with the, with the previous one, but uh, also I wanted to ask, it's been over five years now that I own my gallery. And I'm thinking, is it okay to um, raise my prices over the time? Is, is that okay here, living in, in this country? And I just wanted to know your opinion about it. Well, um, I, I think um, it depends on a lot of things. I think... Um, I, I, can, I can be more specif specified if you want. Yeah, please. Uh, because um, I am an amateur, but I'm, I've, I've been doing this for the for many years, um, and at the beginning, I I thought I need to start from somewhere, and my prices were were kind of really low. Uh, but now, with the, with a bigger gallery, with bigger expenses, with um, and I'm moving forward, and I can feel that, and money wise, and and uh, I've got more customers and stuff, and I'm thinking it's okay to raise my price, my, my uh, value of my uh, labor as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I've done that, but I'm not sure how, how much more I can do because I want to also fit into the environment where I live and be available to, to all the customers around me yeah. with, with the prices. Um, okay, a few points to make then. Um, is it okay? Well, Yes, I think so. Um, but it, I would say there's different ways to look at it, partly from necessity. If we calculate your prices and you're losing money, which is section one, you know, understanding the costs, then we need, we actually need to improve. It's not, is it okay? We need to increase prices yeah. okay. because you're going to lose money and go bankrupt. So there's, the first level is about necessity. And then the next level is about your value. And you're, you're saying that you're becoming better, you deserve more money, and you want to increase your prices, and, and that's correct, that's, that's fine. Um, so we can increase them further on the basis of your value. At that point though, we need to be, we probably um, need to be more selective about customers because some of your customers won't be able to uh, pay that higher price. Yeah. That's right. So maybe you need to find new customers. Even if your gallery is in one location, um, you might have to attract customers from outside the area. Okay. So this is where we need, this is where we look at marketing in a strategic point of view. You know, um, I used to run a bookshop. My first business was a bookshop and it was in a small town and we wanted to serve the town. But actually, I came to realize the town wasn't big enough to support a bookshop. Um, there weren't enough customers. And only 15 kilometers away, there was a big city. So people could go there. So mm -hmm. we had a bit of a problem with our location. And location is part of marketing because mm -hmm. we were putting ourselves in not the most lucrative market. You know, it wasn't in the middle of New York City or London. It was in a small town. So there's a marketing issue there. Um, and finally, which is worth mentioning in answer to your question, but it really applies to a lot of people, is that oftentimes when people start up, let's go back to the jeweler uh, rather than talk about yourself, they start as a hobby. And at that point, they're doing it for fun. So they, they're doing it in their home. They don't have to pay for a studio. They don't even need to make money themselves because they already have a real job, or another job elsewhere. So they are happy to make jewelry that costs 100 euros for the parts 
and sell it for 120 just to make a little few extra dollars or euros. So that's fine. There's nothing wrong with people having a hobby. And you might say it's a paying hobby. But the problem is that the economics are hobby economics. The pricing is hobby pricing. And it's okay as long as it's a hobby. And then the person says to me, David, you know, I'm going to give up my job in the bank. I'm going to do my love of jewellery full time. And this is when everything changes. Because like yourself, they need a studio. They have real costs. They have to pay themselves a salary. And then the prices no longer make sense. Mm. They, when we do the sums, they probably have to increase their prices by three times. Massive increases. As when they switch suddenly from being a hobbyist to a business. And at that point, they lose customers. And they probably lose friends as well. Because <laughs> their friends have been buying for 100 euros or 120 euros. And on Monday morning, you say, oh, by the way, friend, I can't afford to sell for 120 euros anymore. It's now 600 euros. And they go, oh, it's a ripoff. I don't like you anymore. Why are you doing this to me? So this is a danger when you move from being a hobbyist to mm. a professional business. Mm. But it also happens in a smaller way when you start off small and timid about pricing, you know, very cautious about pricing, and then start to move up. Because in a way, we define ourselves by our pricing. Mm. And if people then don't understand why you need to charge more, Maybe it's their fault for not valuing your art, but we have to admit it's also our fault because we stated the price in the first place. And this happens with graphic designers, anybody who's starting, photographers. At first, they're very timid about prices. They don't charge enough. And then they become resentful that people don't value them, but they set the price. That's right, yeah. So, this is why we need to understand prices from the beginning and set the price correctly from the beginning. Because if we start with hobby prices, um, we, don't, we don't make money. And then if we try to change those prices, the customers don't get it and we have to find new customers. So the quicker and the sooner we can set the correct prices at the beginning of a business, the better. If we've already set low prices, we have then a problem to increase them. Yes, okay. it's not okay to increase them. Yes, we should increase them. Mm. But we've created a problem for ourselves. That's right. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have one more question, um, a short one, I would say, uh, from Leila. Uh, she says, uh, to simplify the rule, could we say that to cover all our costs, we should first use the economic point of view and if the customer don't pay this price we uh, need new kind of customers yeah i think so that's a good um it's a good starting point you know if we can't make the business work at the break even level you know at the break even if the business doesn't work then or customers won't buy we have to yeah, we have to find new customers or, or change the business, you know, stop the business maybe. So that's the first test. If we can, um, on the other hand, if, we, if customers will pay that price, the break-even price, then we have a starting point. And after that, we can start increasing prices, finding new customers and moving on. But if we can't even achieve a level of finding customers for the break-even price, then we have big trouble. So yes, uh, we can do this one stage at a time. And that's why deliberately the, the first section was the first section. We need to understand the, the basic economics, make sure that is okay. And then we start adding to the price as we add more value and we choose uh, better customers. Good. Uh, Leila is smiling, so I guess she's happy with the answer. 
Um, we don't have any additional questions at the moment. We can go to the third section and then we can open up for um, the rest of the questions. Okay. So, um, pricing for um, benefits, options, and intellectual property. The first thing to make is a, is a, a key point of marketing, which is about selling benefits, not features. And we need to price accordingly. In other words, in terms of marketing communications, we need to talk to the customer about what's in it for them, not what's in it for us. So the problem is that we are involved in our businesses. We love our businesses. We know everything about our business. We know about the raw materials. We know about the process. We know about what we do in the office or the studio. And that's important, but it's not what the customer wants. Um, so using art or shall we say ceramics as an example, the potter might say, might know about the, the quality of the clay that they make, the process of designing and shaping the clay into a, a pot or a vase, and then painting and glazing. And we'll talk about the, the paints and the, and the clay, etc. But the customer is not interested. The customer wants the end product, a beautiful vase. And so we need to emphasize the beauty and how this will look in your house, how this will make your flat or your apartment or house even more beautiful. Um, and so we often fail to emphasize what's in it for the customer because we talk so much about the details of the product, the, uh, the features of the product. And if the customer is looking at you when you talk uh, and they ask, so what? Then you haven't emphasized the benefits to the customer. You've talked only about the product features. Let me give you an example from, uh, from my business, my uh, life, because I've learned so much about business Yes, I've been to business school. Yes, I've had many businesses. Yes, I've started and grown businesses. But I've also made lots of mistakes in business. And let me tell you about one of them, just one of the many. Some years ago, I had a new website. And eventually it was ready. And I was so pleased and proud about my new website. So I wanted to tell all my contacts about it. And I sent out small numbers of emails, personalized, to the first 10 people and the email headline or subject was David Parrish has a new website and then underneath in the body it talked about the website and all the information and videos and content. I sent out this email to 10 people David Parrish has a new website and then I looked at Google Analytics and nobody opened the video sorry nobody opened the email so I thought, well, maybe I need to shout louder. And this time I used capital letters. David Parrish has a new website. And I sent out 10 emails and nobody opened them. And I was very frustrated. So I decided I needed to shout even louder. And this time, capital letters, underlining, bold, David Parrish has a new website. 10 emails, nobody opened them. And so I decided to have a word with myself. I tapped myself on the shoulder and said, David, come over here, let me have a word. David, what would you say to a client if they did this? Ah, I said, I'm talking about features, not benefits. I'm talking about my website and what's in it for me that I am so pleased. And they're receiving these emails and thinking, good for him, good for David. He's got a new website, so what? Delete. So now I changed the subject line and said, cool business ideas for creative people like you. And now people opened my uh, email and looked at my website. 
because now I was talking about customer benefits. I was talking about what was in it for them, not what was in it for me. And it's a, a silly, simple mistake that we all make. We need to look at things from the customer's point of view and emphasize what's in it for the customer. And what's in it for the customer might be different than we imagine. So the next section is about adding value and selling the complete bundle. So we have a product and we have a price. This might be a painting, it might be a vase, it might be uh, any product. But we can charge more if we have very nice packaging. Maybe we need to, um, maybe we can add delivery options or express delivery. Maybe we can offer an aftercare service. Maybe we can provide a guarantee or a certificate of authentication. Or we can follow up by uh, keeping in touch with the customer to advise them on how to use it. And all these things may be what the customer wants. And if so, we can charge more. But we don't know about these things until we ask the customer. And this is why marketing is a two way process. It's about a dialogue with the customer so that we can understand what they really want. Maybe they aren't buying our, our products because um, they need international delivery and we're not offering that. Maybe they're not buying our products because the packaging is very poor. Maybe they're not buying our products because they want a certificate of authenticity or a guarantee. And until we understand what the customer wants, we can't provide it and therefore we can't charge for it. But by listening to customers, we can add value and sell not only the direct product, but the extras, these extra things, which I call the complete bundle. So that's worth bearing in mind. And then thirdly, we come on to uh, what is the customer buying really? And this is where it gets interesting. And let me tell you another story. Because we think we're selling vases or paintings, maybe, or uh, any you know, architectural services or photographs or designs or websites. And indeed, yes, we are, of course we are. But what is the customer buying really? And this is where it gets fascinating. So two examples come to mind. One is the, uh, the Harley Davidson company. And I can ask you, um, what do Harley Davidson sell? And one answer, a correct answer, you will tell me is, David, they sell motorbikes. True, correct. And just in case you didn't know anybody there, uh, yes, the Harley Davidson company, they sell motorbikes. That's true. But it's only really half the answer because some of you are already thinking, actually, it's more than that. They're selling more than a motorbike. Now, let me tell you uh, what they're selling. And this is a quote uh, I found from an executive within the Harley Davidson company. This is not a journalist or an analyst or a consultant. This is somebody from within the company, the Harley Davidson company. And he says this, what we sell is the ability for a 43 year old accountant to dress in black leathers, ride through small towns and have people be afraid of him. This is what they're selling. They're selling the experience of being a weekend hell's angel. They're actually selling, you might say, a solution to a midlife crisis. They're selling a solution to people who have more money than sense. And they know their market. 43 year old accountants with a midlife crisis who've got lots of money and want to make up for the lack of a misspent youth and to be a hell's angel at the weekend. This is what they're selling. 
And once they understand that, they can price accordingly. If they made the mistake of believing that they were selling simple transportation, they would have to be in competition with Honda, who also make motorbikes. But they're not in that game at all. What they're really selling is the experience, the brand, the feel-good factor, or maybe the feel-bad factor. This is what they're selling. And once they understand that, they can price it accordingly. And that is why Harley-Davidson motorbikes are not twice as much as Honda's or three times, but maybe hundreds of times more expensive. Because what they're selling is not a motorbike, it's, a, it's a, an experience. And this applies to many, many uh, businesses and products. And we need to understand what the customer is really buying. Maybe when you're selling websites, you're also offering consultancy. You know, maybe you're selling um, a brand that makes people feel good. Apple know this. One of the reasons I got my Apple uh, MacBook Pro is because before that, many years ago, I used to have a Sony Vio. And when I went to creative uh, business studios, they would look down their nose at me because I wasn't a cool creative like them. So um, I rebranded myself and I bought myself an Apple, which is the cool product, especially in the creative industries. So when I buy a computer, it's not just a functional piece of kit. It's something, it's a brand that says something about myself. So, and then ask yourself, why did you buy such a car? Why did you live in such a district of the city? Why did you pay more for the clothing you're wearing? And it's because it's more than clothing. It's more than an apartment. You know, it's more than a car. We're buying a lot of intangible stuff. And once we understand what the customer is really buying, we, need, we can price, we can increase our prices. But we need to understand that. And very often we don't understand it. So coming back to the next point, which is about the price of selling or licensing your intellectual property. And I'll just talk about this briefly because when we create a product, let's say we create a sculpture, we could sell the object to an art gallery or to a, a municipality or a company. But are we also selling the intellectual property? Are we selling the design as well as the product? Now, we have to be careful here because we could accidentally sell the, the design, in which case the company that buys your sculpture could make replicas of it and sell them. They own not only the sculpture, but the design. They can make key rings or gifts from the same design if you're selling your intellectual property. And you can't do the same thing because you've sold the very design as well as the product. Or you can make it clear that you are not selling your intellectual property, that you are um, in effect licensing the product to them. They can, they can have the one individual uh, item of sculpture Maybe they're allowed to uh, sell photographs of it, but it's still yours. And so we get into the whole area of licensing intellectual property, which is partly about products, artistic products, but it can also be about uh, services to some extent. And so when I uh, write a book, that book is my intellectual property, my copyright. You can download my book, my free ebook, um, from my website, T-shirts and suits, a guide to the business of creativity. But even though you now own a copy of the book, you don't own the copyright in it. You can't go and sell the book yourself. You're just buying one, um, one paperback or one ebook or getting the ebook for free. And another example on my website, which you can find and I can provide you a link to it, is about an illustrator, a commercial illustrator in Brazil. He makes illustrations 
and he sells them to Coca-Cola and Vodafone and Nike, who use the use his illustrations for their um, advertising. But actually, he doesn't sell his illustrations; he licenses them, and so the companies have to pay him for permission to use his illustrations, perhaps in packaging for one year, and they pay him thousands and thousands of dollars. And then if they want to use the same illustration for a different purpose, perhaps in their stores, they have to pay him again. So he's actually not selling, but licensing his intellectual property to um, the customer. And this happens often in photography, and can happen with product designs and many other aspects of the creative industries. So there are just some thoughts about pricing, the benefits um, and the options and intellectual property, which brings me to the, the end of um, my presentation and summarizing to say we've talked about those three sections, pricing in relation to costs and profits, pricing, perceptions, and positioning, and thirdly, pricing the benefits, options, and intellectual property. So at this point, we can come back to um, questions about section three, and perhaps some more general questions um, about the whole, uh, the whole uh, webinar, and any other advice I can give, or please also share your experience. It's not just questions and answers, but if you've done something cool with pricing yourself that you want to share, then please, um, please let us know. And this is the book I mentioned earlier, my marketing book, uh, Chase One Rabbit, Strategic uh, Marketing for Business Success. And that's on my website. You can uh, get it as an audio book, ebook, or paperback. Um, so please take a look. There are some free sections and some samples that you can read free of charge. And they're all in that section of my website. So over to you guys. Questions, comments, stories, please. Um, so the same as before, if you want to speak, you can unmute yourself. Um, before you do that, I will just read one of the questions. Uh, Selma, thank you for sharing. Uh, also some mistakes that you did with your business and um, she thought that the example about Davidson was uh, excellent to understand the, the um, whole uh, theoretical approach that you uh, explained. Uh, so Amira said, uh, thank you very much. It was very helpful. It, uh, does that mean that we need more attention on creating uh, avatar or buying persona if yes, can we get more details, advices on that point? Yeah, I think one way to, um, when we're talking about choosing the right customers, we can, um, we can have prototype customers or um, you know, stereotype customers. And, and this is where we're talking about avatars. We can say, um, so if I'm talking to a business, for example, and I ask them, who are their customers? And they might say, well, actually, we've got three types of customers for our clothing. You know, we have, um, we have young women aged, uh, I don't know, 20 to 30, who are probably professionals living in a city. But we also sell to people in another country who really like our style. But these are actually maybe older women who are buying our products. And then we find that uh, there's a, a different type of customer, you know, whatever is relevant. Um, so they understand the three avatars, the three kind of types of customer, and you can then speak to them separately because actually each type of customer might see different value. You know, the, the, the young professional woman might look at the clothing because it's stylish, it's durable, it, it works in a business setting. Um, and that's what she's concerned about to look professional in her work. Whereas the, perhaps the older woman in a different city She's thinking about using the same clothing or range for more social purposes. So we might talk to them differently. Um, so yes, we can divide our customers up in that way. And it also brings me back to another point. Um, 
when we talk about finding new customers because I have this conversation very often with my clients. We realize they need new customers and they ask me, David, how do I find, how do I find new customers? And they may need actually hundreds of customers to make their business viable. But it's, it's kind of a big challenge to find 100 customers all at once. So I say, let's start simple. Let's do it step by step. And I ask them, if you had to find just one customer, just one ideal customer in the next two weeks, what would you do? And I might exaggerate and say, if I put a gun to your head and said, if you don't find an ideal customer within two weeks, I will kill you. I'm not really a murderer. Then what would they do? And this really focuses the mind. We really think, who, who can I contact who is an ideal customer? And then we start to think more practically. We start to think, what about the the person who used to be a customer three years ago, they've moved on, now they have more money. Maybe that is an ideal customer. Maybe a friend of my brother or sister is an ideal customer. Maybe um, I have a connection with somebody or an indirect connection. So it's a good idea, I think, to, to try to identify the type of customers that you need even starting with one customer. Because if this is an ideal customer who's gonna pay good money, a lot of money for your products or services, who's gonna buy again and again, the chances are they, they, the people they know, professionally or personally, will also be ideal customers. And so word will spread. So choose it in a way, choosing that first customer is the most important thing. If we do this in a random way, or if we've got a bunch of wrong customers who are paying too little, bad customers, they will also talk. And the people they know will also have no money and will get even more of the wrong customers. So we need the right starting point. And this is where it's very useful to think uh, strategically and analytically about finding the right customer and, and approaching them. Um, and building from there and then it might become more sophisticated as we identify three or four different kinds of customers some customers might want to buy our art simply because they love it and it looks good other people might want to buy our art because they are collectors and see it as an investment so again there are different benefits to those two people and we need to emphasize benefits differently but we have different two different messages actually to two different kinds of customers. Just like the young woman who buys clothing for professional wear, we talk about how she will get promotion and look cool in a business meeting. Uh, whereas a woman who's buying our clothing for social purposes will say that it will look fantastic at the party and her friends will envy her or whatever our message is. So yes, we need to become sophisticated in understanding the different kinds of customers. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. Uh, so we have a couple of more um, questions. Sorry. Um, first one is from uh, Sarah. Uh, as a photographer, I sometimes get people offering to compensate my work in exposure or in the product I'm shooting. Uh, what would be an assertive way to address it to open dialogue and get paid as everyone else in money? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, it's a very good question because this is the reality um, very often um, at the start of a business. I would say actually, um, even when a business is more established, sometimes we might choose to, um, to get exposure instead of a fee because it's part of our marketing strategy. So sometimes I participate in events without being paid. Um, it's not because I'm not expensive. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very expensive, but I might choose for a particular reason to get exposure in a new market. And that could be a, a calculation. 
that could be a valid calculation. But I think what um, the other situation is when people are quite new in business, they don't yet have a reputation. And this is probably what you're talking about. You start as a photographer, you don't have a lot of customers, you, can't, you don't charge a lot of money, and then you're very vulnerable because people will perhaps exploit the fact that uh, you're not very well known. And they say, you know, work for us for nothing and then we can uh, promote you and give you exposure, publicity, and it will lead to other customers. And it's a, it's a difficult one actually, because um, in some ways we might not have a choice, but we have to be very careful. And I would say, um, this also happens when people say, offer you a lower price than you really need. I think the way to do it, if you have to do it, or you decide it's, um, it's valid for a strategic reason to get into a new market, to get the publicity, is to have two prices. And I write in my book, the book that's uh, behind me here, um, there's a section called an invoice can have two prices. So in other words, when somebody, if you choose to do something for free or for a very low price as a goodwill gesture or for publicity, then you can accept a lower price, but without allowing them to think that that is the, your real price. So for example, I work around the world. I often go to a city to do a conference or consultancy. And sometimes when I'm in the city, the university says, David, will you speak to the uh, students? And I'm happy to do that for fun. And they say, David, uh, we know you're an international speaker and you, people pay you thousands and thousands of euros, but we can only afford to pay you uh, 100 euros, a small amount. So what do I do? A hundred euros is not much money, but my biggest fear is that people will regard me as a hundred euro speaker. So sometimes I say to a university, don't pay me at all, because I don't want word to go around that you can get David Parrish for a hundred euros. It's not good for my image, not good for my brand. And so it's a, there's a danger. And this relates to your position where you're working for free or for a low price. So what we can do is say, um, okay, university, I will speak my normal speaking fee as an international speaker is let's say $10,000. That's my fee. And I pause deliberately. In other words, do you get it? Do you realize the value I really am? That's what, that's my value. However, on this occasion, as a goodwill gesture, I will give you a massive discount and I will charge you only a hundred euros. But please remember my true value. So in this way, an invoice has two prices. The bottom line, hundred euros is all I get. That's the ultimate price. But I haven't made the mistake of allowing them to say, to believe that I'm only worth 100 euros. Because if I say, yeah, 100 euros is okay, the university will tell their friends at another university, David Parrish will speak for 100 euros. And they will tell the conference organizers, David Parrish will speak for 100 euros. And I'm in big, big trouble. So I need to establish my price. This is about positioning, branding reputation put your real price and then if for some reason you decide to on a special occasion to offer zero or a very low price you can put that as well but then it's on record and when they come back to you next year and they say david will you speak at the university again for 100 euros i say please look at look at the price I made an exception once 
but now we go back to the real price. So pricing, this emphasizes very clearly, pricing is partly about what you get tomorrow in cash in your bank, the reality. But pricing is also about reputation, brand and positioning. So I would say if you're starting at the beginning as a graphic designer or photographer or anything, establish your real price at the beginning, even if you can't charge it because you're still finding your feet, you're, you're in a very weak position. You might have to say, as a graphic designer, this really is worth a thousand euros, but okay, I will do it for you, my friend, for 300 euros. So you get the work, but you're not damaging your reputation. You're not setting a precedent that says, this is all I am worth ever. That's, that's the crucial difference for me. I don't know if that answers your question. I hope so. But if not, please come back. Uh, we have a couple of more questions uh, lined up. Um, they are not really, some are connected, some are not. So I will just uh, go in the order they were uh, posted. Uh, so Selma asked, having in mind that there is so many marketing, that there are so many marketing strategies, in your opinion, what would be the best strategy uh, for a startup that doesn't have very much money to invest in marketing? Would that be giving discounts, loyalty, coupons, uh, social media, etc.? cetera? Uh, and then we have also a question from Ivana as a kind of a juxtaposition. Uh, would you agree that adding a value, uh, creating uh, new upgraded offers, creating tribe community, et cetera, is more appropriate and effective strategy than offering discounts in creative industry? Uh, okay, so um, good. both are very good questions and they kind of connect, my answer connects them both, I think, because I think at the beginning, um, what often happens is people just, they don't have, they don't know who their customer is. They create a product or a service, they're starting, and they don't think about who is their ideal customer. They just get excited about social media and send out a million posts and hope that somebody somewhere buys something. And I understand that, but it's very desperate. It's not very strategic. In contrast, I think what we should do is do some thinking about the ideal customer. And like I said earlier, find that one customer and sell to them. Find the right price that they're prepared to pay that works for you also. And from one customer who is very happy uh, with our product and indeed with any extras as well, we can then use word of mouth marketing. In other words, they will tell other people because if we get that first customer in the right social circles or the right type of customer or working in a particular city or working in a particular industry, then probably they will tell other people who, who are like them. And so we get more customers of the same type. So I think that actually this word of mouth marketing, you know, individual customer re recommendations is extremely powerful. It's really, really good. But somehow it's underrated and it confuses me. And it intrigues me because I've had conversations with somebody who perhaps they're, say, a website designer and they are only in business for six months. They only have a few customers and they want more customers. So they come to me asking the same question. Should I spend money on Facebook advertising? Should I do social media? Should I advertise in the local press? Should I do this or that? Because I need some customers. What should be my marketing strategy? And then I say, well, hang on, tell me about your existing customers. You told me you already have four or five customers. How did they come about? And they say, well, one customer already knew me at my old company and they came and stayed with me when I went independent. Another customer is a friend of mine who has a shop and they needed an e-commerce website. And another customer is a friend of theirs who was recommended. And um, 
and now they're a customer. And to me, this is music to my ears. But they said they don't have a marketing strategy. They want to spend a lot of money on something really clever that will bring them strangers to their door. But actually, most businesses, most successful businesses, grow more organically by word of mouth. So what we need to do is regard our best customers as our marketing department and encourage them to, um, to tell other people. And if a customer is delighted in what we do, ask them to write a testimonial and then you put it on your website. And so instead of on your web website, you saying you're fantastic or your products are fantastic, you've got a customer saying it. And if people can relate to that customer because they, they have a, a restaurant, because that customer is a professional or that customer is from their city, they're likely to follow that customer. So your customers are your marketing department, really, if you treat them well and they will talk. And in that sense, you don't need to answer. I can answer the second question because you don't need to offer discounts. If you're offering discounts, it's because people are price sensitive. But somebody who wants a discount will soon go to somebody else who's cheaper. You're playing the price game. You're playing the game of discounts and lowering prices. And so it's a race to the bottom. So I would say, yes, occasionally there might be, there might occasionally be circumstances when you give discounts, but generally I would caution against it. Um, and I would say it's better to find customers who are pleased to pay your full price because they get it, they understand, and they see the value in what you do. And similarly, when if one of my customers recommends me to another customer, I could, I could incentivize them by saying you get a discount, but I think it's a little bit cheap. It's a little bit mercenary. You know, it's much better to allow people to enthuse about you and your products to other customers, and then simply to say thank you. Thank you for recommending this next customer. Send them a bottle of wine, send them a gift. But discounts are a little bit tacky, I think, or commissions even sometimes just seem a little bit mercenary. So uh, I was hoping that that question might, that the answer might answer both questions to some extent, but maybe it did neither. So please, either one of those can come back to me. Yeah, you can have a follow up girls if, if you want to add something uh, or to go into specific details. Uh, I will use the opportunity to ask another question. Uh, Irma said, uh, in a time of crisis like the one we are facing now, how to draw attention to creative industries without being seen as aggressive when people are not thinking about art but rather have basic needs? Quite often, a creative industry uh, products uh, and services are seen as luxury, so how to draw attention to, to um, uh, creative industries in, in uh, this situation and maybe just to add should we have another approach to pricing during this time? Mm -hmm. well? Okay um, so I think we can talk about the creative industries on two levels we can talk about the creative industries on a macroeconomic level you know the whole economy of creativity and so if we look at the creative industries in total, they are often uh, sometimes regarded as luxury goods. Um, but we can also look at the creative industries on a microeconomic level. In other words, at the level of each individual business. And I, I think it's difficult to sell the creative industries as a whole right now. People have more immediate concerns about their health, and about their, their income. So I don't think this is a cool, a great time to talk about the creative industries in general because there are more immediate concerns. But that's maybe not for us, it's not for me to do, and probably not for any of us to do. If we have individual businesses, like I have a business and you have a business, 
then we are thinking about the specifics. And we might realize that some of our customers right now don't want to buy or can't buy or don't have the money. But we might find that others of our customers, some specific customers, do need to buy. You know, so when we talk about the specifics, we can identify sweet spots or exceptions. We might know that some of our customers still have money, even though many of them no longer do. We might, ident we might identify that some of our products are exactly perfect for this time. So right now, uh, I know web designers, uh, lots of people are cutting back on general web development um, or new websites, but some customers want an addition to their website to have an e-commerce shop. So within our range of products, within our range of services, there might be something that is really useful right now. So instead of trying to sell the creative industries as a whole, instead of trying to sell everything that your, your company or business does, think about specific customers and specific products. So, you know, right now, um, I'm not able to travel to go to conferences. Six of my conferences have been overseas have been canceled because of coronavirus. Um, there's no real answer to that right now, but I can write books. I can sell my books. At the moment, people have lots of time at home to read books. So I can switch from selling my conference speaking to selling my books because they are relevant right now. This is a perfect time, guys, when you're at home to read about business, um, learn about business and develop your plans for the next stage. So I think if we look at the specifics, there will be specific customers we still can sell to and specific elements of our business that are still relevant. Or maybe we can even invent new uh, products or services from our skill set that are relevant because the economy is not closed completely. And some parts of the economy right now are in big, big trouble for example, restaurants. But other parts of the economy are doing really well. For example, earlier today, I went to a bike shop to have my bike serviced. And they're busier than ever. Com uh, creative industries, businesses selling computer games are busier than ever. And website designers who are allowing people to sell online because their shops are closed, are busier than ever. So it isn't, it isn't a total disaster for the whole of the creative industries. And therefore we need to look at the specific sweet spots or specific opportunities. And that's what I urge you to do within your business. This might be a time to do something new, to focus on just a few customers or just to focus on a few services or products. Um, and if none of those things, maybe it's time to do some strategizing, some reading and planning uh, for when things become better. So I don't think it's a total disaster for the creative industries. I think that there are plenty of uh, opportunities if we look very carefully and specifically. Thanks, David. Um, we have more questions. Uh, Ines uh, says, uh, I offer a service of photography and styling food. How to set the right price without having a real uh, competitors, the reference point in the niche in my country, uh, plus having a variety of, of clients who want different kind of packages, services. Mm -hmm. So how to set the right price? Yeah, okay, good question. Um, and I think, Interestingly, in your question, you use the word niche. And I think that is one uh, strategy that's very often a successful one. So that as a photographer, for example, um, photography is a good example because many people start off and they can do many kinds of photography. And 
they don't have a niche yet and they're trying to make a living and that's okay. So they're doing some, some wedding photography and some uh, advertising photography, some architectural photography, some uh, animals, some landscapes, some abstract, and maybe some food photography. They're doing a bit of everything. And you know, that's often how people start. The problem with that is that for each of those sections, somewhere there is a specialist. So you might be quite good at wedding photography, but somebody else is a specialist who does that. And therefore they get a better reputation, they get more word of mouth, they get better at their job, and they become the go-to guy for wedding photography. And you can't compete with them. So by being a jack of all trades, you're a master of none. By trying to do everything, there's always a, a specialist who beats you in each particular niche. So the answer then, I think, is to find your niche. Find your niche. Um, and it might be, for example, food photography, which means, you know, find uh, one good customer in the beginning and then build a relationship with them. So this is an example where we're selling more than the obvious thing. What is the customer buying really? So if, if I ask the, your client in food photography, why do they choose you? They will say, um, because they take really good photographs. And that's what I expect. That's what they're buying, isn't it? They're buying good food photographs from you. But they will also say, I don't, somebody else is cheaper, but I choose to stay with this same photographer because he or she is reliable. They, they always deliver on time. They always deliver. And that is important to us. So I'm buying a photograph, but I'm also buying reliability. And then they might say, uh, actually, they're now more expensive than anybody else, but we still stay with them because we like working with them. They're good fun to work with. They're friends, they, they support our business. They understand our business objectives. We think in the same way. And so you see, this is, goes back to the earlier section, that people are buying more than just the simple service. They're buying not only a photograph, but reliability, uh, the, uh, that it's nice to work with you and other things. And this is how we can increase our prices. And we can more easily do that within a particular niche or with a particular group of customers. So it might be a speciality for food photography. It might be a speciality of working with customers who are of a certain community. And we can then develop that further and it becomes stronger and stronger and we consolidate our reputation in that community and that niche and then we can more comfortably increase prices because we become better and we become uh, our reputation gets better and the price can follow and i guess that's been my experience also because when i started in consultancy i was working in arts creative industries hotels insurance uh, not-for-profits a bit of everything, whatever I could get. But in the end, I decided which one do I have the best chance of establishing a good reputation of dominating the niche and charging higher prices. And after some years, it became clear that it was the creative industries. And so now my website, it doesn't say I work in all these different fields because I don't. I've decided on my niche and I'm building my reputation in a, in a specialist niche. If and I may add, uh, David, sorry to interrupt you. The, the very specific point of Ines here was that she doesn't have competition in the country and then doesn't know how to like position herself in terms of uh, pricing, especially when she's serving a couple of categories of customers. Um, so, I mean, no, having no competition sounds good. So in that sense, if I understand correctly, no you have competition for that niche, not in general. So it's great that you have a, a particular niche all to yourself, 
And in that sense, uh, in pure terms of monopoly pricing, you know, you can charge whatever you want because if they've got nowhere else to go, you're in a very strong position. And that's, you know, that's good. I'm not saying you should be silly, but um, that, that's quite good. Um, because the reason people don't charge higher prices is often because of competition. And that's why niche working uh, is a good strategy because there's less competition. So I would say in, in the area where you have a niche, uh, or we have customers in a niche, you know, just just keep increasing your prices. Um, and then this remind me the second part of the question is how to what find new customers. Can you remind me of the second part of the question? Uh, about the customers. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, she's having a variety of clients who have different kind of package, uh, uh, different kind of services. So she's kind of making packages from each. So it's customized from for different client segments. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer, but I think that because if you have different clients and different kinds of projects and different packages, then it's a fantastic opportunity to experiment with pricing. So you can say to a customer, well, for this package, you want X, Y, and Z. Um, so I can charge, you know, th there isn't a comparison with other things. So you, it's a unique package, so you can have a unique price. And then you can, you can suggest a very high price. Um, so you say to the customer, well, yes, you can have A, B, and C, and I will also give you D, uh, a package. And that for that, it's going to be 12,000 euros. And hopefully they will say, good, fine. But if they then say, mm, it's too much, I've only got 10,000 euros, then you can say, well, in that case, I'll give you A, B, C, and D, but not E. You can then tailor the package. So I think that it's a very fluid situation. I think that that means there is no... I cannot give you a correct, precise answer, but I think that it's very positive as well because it means you have lots of opportunity for um, trying new prices, discussing prices, playing around with different packages, and yeah, experimenting and learning. But the, 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 the main tip is to start with a very high price, to say to a customer, I will offer you a big package at a big price. And then when, if it's too much, you can reduce the price by, by reducing the package. On the other hand, it's very difficult the other way. If you offer a big package and you say 200 euros and they say, really, so little, fine. What do you do next? You can't say, oh, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I meant not 200, 2000. You're stuck, you've trapped yourself. So it's always better to start high and, and come down in terms of the price and the package, it's very difficult or more difficult to start very low pricing and build up the price. So I think you have an opportunity to learn and just experiment and, and try things out and see how it goes. Excellent advice. I think um, many um, people, especially in creative industry, are afraid that they will lose um, their clients in a way, but you address this point. Um, uh, very in a very comprehensive way in the second section. Um, there is one, uh, let's say, gender specific uh, question. Uh, Diana wrote, uh, women face issues with assertiveness quite often when it comes to communicating the price of their product services, uh, often feeling discomfort when pronouncing the price, the imposter syndrome. Uh, now we face this challenge uh, of um, possible need of rising the price, which might make uh, all this even worse. Uh, would be great to hear your comment on this tip, uh, tips and tricks, how to address this. I, I understand the situation and I, I, I take your point that many women feel, uh, you know, it's difficult to be assertive or confident about prices. I have to say many men also do um, in the creative industries, um, but you know, I think um, there are a couple of different answers. 
it's one is um, to find the right customers. If if customers are saying are asking you why why are you charging so much for your creativity, then maybe you're dealing with the wrong customer. Um, so I would say that we need to find customers who who get it and who to whom we don't have to apologize. This, this, this goes back to strategic marketing. If you're, you know, it, marketing and pricing should be easy if you're dealing with the right customers because they love you, they get you, they value you, and they will pay you. So partly the pricing embarrassment is a function of having the wrong or the right customer. You know, the right customer will happily pay the right price. If you're dealing with the wrong customers, then it's it's just painful. So that's part of it. Another um, another mm, trick or tip, if you like, is to use an intermediary to negotiate for you. So um, I don't usually do this, but it happened almost by by chance when I was contacted from an organization in Brazil and they wanted me to go to Brazil to speak at a conference and they were gonna pay me and pay my expenses, which is all very nice and cool. But the, um, I don't speak Portuguese and their English was not very good. So there was a real danger in these emails that we would misunderstand each other. So I asked my friend uh, Fabio, who lives in Rio in Brazil to, to uh, communicate with them because he could speak very good English with me and he obviously speaks uh, Portuguese as a Brazilian. So he then spoke to them and he was speaking about the fee and he was saying to them, uh, you do realize, you know, David Parrish is a world-class speaker. He's not cheap you have to pay a really good price for David, you know? And they said, oh, okay, yeah, sure. So he was um, acting like my agent and he was able to get a very good fee for me um, because it wasn't personal. Whereas I would be embarrassed to talk that way about myself, you know, um, because it sounds big headed, it sounds arrogant. Um, and so maybe sometimes you can use a, a third party. And this can be through a retailer. This is what shops do. You know, a shop will sell at a price to a customer on your behalf if it's a retail product. But it can be done um, in services by using an agent. And the guy I mentioned also from Brazil who makes the, uh, the commercial illustrations, which he doesn't sell, but he licenses to coca-cola nike and vodafone he doesn't negotiate the price or the fee himself he works through an agency an advertising agency and they of course take a commission a cut but they are able to say to uh, nike you have to pay a hundred thousand dollars for this um, so they're more confident and more used to it negotiation than um the guy himself, Guillermo, who is a fantastic illustrator, but he's not a fantastic negotiator. So there are different ways, different approaches. But I think that over time we become more confident. We, we start to realize what we're worth. The more people, the more we find the right customers who pay us, the more confident we become and the less willing we are to be to reduce our prices. So we, we become stronger and more confident through experience, but we have to go carefully and strategically and maybe use some uh, little tips and tricks along the way. Um, if I may add uh, experience that we have uh, at the foundation as we are working with uh, many founders, one of the, let's say more extreme examples was with one of the female founders uh, that offered uh, like uh, external gardening services uh, for businesses. And um, uh, she was um, kind of working for a couple of years, but working with different uh, segments, um, different types of businesses. 
And um, at some point she realized that she had really high discomfort in, in saying the price, um, setting the price for the package for them, etc. cetera. And um, um, we advised her that uh, she could say, okay, I have this package, as you said, uh, I have this package that includes this and this is it, and this is the price, but uh, that she can also approach it in a way, okay, so what budget did you, um, you know, allocate uh, for this. So let's see what things from the, my package actually can fit into into the the budget that, that you had in mind. And uh, what happened is that like people uh, were actually having uh, 10 times more uh, higher uh, amounts than she would assume because she was thinking like nobody will actually pay uh, that much, but she brought them a uh, value that they needed. They knew why it's important for them. Um, so maybe one of the tricks uh, when you are at the beginning you, doing the discovery of who are your customers, it is good to ask, so what budget did you um, allocate for this? What budget did you have in mind? Um, and then uh, start kind of a negotiation uh, from there, uh, but not underprice yourself. Yeah. And I, and I would endorse that. I would absolutely agree that if you can ask the customer the budget, then that's, that's great. And then going back to the previous question about the bundles, the packages, you can suit the package to the bundle. So I will say, you know, I can, I can work at different levels, but you get different levels of, of me. You know, you get different amounts of me uh, for different budgets. And so it's a, it's a good conversation. And I also agree that we often underestimate. We assume people don't have the money. And we go in very timid and we say, well, okay, I can do it for 100 euros. And they've got a million euros waiting. You know, and we're just fools to ourselves. So we just, it's a simple question. How much is your budget? They don't always answer, by the way. They don't always tell you. But at that point, I, I say, give, give us a clue. Because sometimes people will say, can you help us with business planning? And I say, how much is your budget? And they say, well, you tell us, you send us a proposal. And I say, no, I'm not prepared to send you a proposal because it will take me half a day to write a proposal. And if I, could say, if I send a proposal for 100,000 euros, and then you turn around and say, David, we only have 3,000 euros, I've wasted my time. So give me a clue. And then I can make a proposal that is appropriate to your budget because otherwise I'm not prepared to do it. I'm just wasting my time. And then they might say, well, actually the maximum we can spend is 20,000 euros, but we have to be careful and we prefer 10,000 euros. Now at least you have a clue and you can decide what you can package and what exact price to go in. So it is a dialogue. It's about negotiation. And the more you can learn from that conversation, um, you, you can, I was advising a client in America, actually just a few weeks ago about this very thing, that in, before giving a price, you have a conversation with the, the customer. You say, if I do this training workshop, um, you know, what, what would you hope would be the outcome? Who are the participants? Who are, who's going to come? What publicity do you get? And then you realize that it's a major project and it's government level and it's so important to them that they bring in the right person and it gives you confidence to charge more. So instead of answering the question directly, you can explore and get a better understanding of the real value that you're offering. And this, is, this goes back to the, the previous points. Understand what the customer is really buying and then you can price accordingly so very very good uh, question and a very interesting area thank you um are there any more questions from the participants mm -hmm. no i don't see anybody you can unmute yourself also if you want to speak if there's no other question, I want to actually um, uh, raise maybe the final one. Uh, it's linked to what we were uh, talking about earlier. 
um, uh, at some instances, but uh, I want to, to ask you like, um, what tactics um, or communication messages you recommend to use when we are, for example, selling uh, one product for a one year, two year, certain period uh, under one price, and then we see that our costs increase or whatever the reason is, we now want to uh, increase it significantly. Um, I believe it's done. It's it's possible to be done uh, with the efficient communication. But is there like a specific way that you would recommend how to address this to increase the price and try to keep the same like the same uh, base of the customers? Mm -hmm. That's a question for me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, it's a good one uh, because, like you say. Um, the price becomes established over the years, but as you, as your organization develops over the years, the costs increase, your expertise increases, you're actually adding more value. And so, um, I mean, one way is to simply, you know, gradually increase the price year by year by a percentage. And this happens with many physical products and many services you know i mean i'm thinking of subscriptions i have for zoom zoom or dropbox or uh, vimeo you know they just keep putting up the prices a little bit um and you you don't really notice so they never get to a position where they say whoops uh we've looked at our costs and we are too low we now have to double so if we can increase it more gradually that's better but if we get to a point where um, we, uh, we need to increase the price, but it's going to be very difficult or very awkward to do, the way to do it then is probably to, uh, to reconfigure the offering. So in supermarkets, they increase prices of uh, say cereals in two ways. One way is to increase the price. So the box of cereals, last week it was two euros, this, this week it's two euros 50. But the other way they increase the price is by making the boxes smaller. So the price doesn't go up, but it used to be 500 grams, now it's 400 grams. So they are actually changing in two dimensions. And they're actually increasing the price without increasing the price by offering less. So it might be that instead of addressing, instead of simply increasing the price in a very uh, bold or very uh, sudden way, you say, the service we've been providing, we've been listening to our customers, we've been looking at different options, and as from next month or next year, we're going to offer two different services. There's going to be one that's like a smaller version and another one that's a, a deluxe version. And because they're now different products, one is bigger than before, it's a bigger box, one is a smaller box, they have different prices. And so by offering more, you can charge more. But for the smaller one, um, it's, we can charge less. But we are, we're matching our costs with the pricing more accurately. So it's, it's a way of kind of complicating things deliberately so that it disguises the price increase. But actually, if you... If you um, it's also quite kind of diplomatic to say, you've been buying my service for five years now. Um, if you want to have an even better service, then that's an option. But of course, you have to pay more. But we understand you might not want to pay more. And so don't worry, you can pay less for the minimum service. So it's up to you. You know, that's your choice. We're offering big, big packets and small packets. And one, yes, is more expensive, but the other one is less expensive. 
So it's whatever, whatever suits your needs and it suits your budget. It's your choice. Um, I don't know if that's helpful. I'm, I'm talking in very abstract ways here. If you want to be more specific or if, if I haven't addressed it properly, then please say so. Um, I think you did an excellent job. And then we have uh, a lot of comments um, in the chat uh, from uh, participants thanking you. Um, it seems that uh, you gave them a lot of ideas how to approach <laughs> their pricing. Um, since we are at um, past five o'clock uh, here, um, I would actually like to close it down uh, the webinar. However, uh, David was very kind to um, offer to be available for some follow-up questions. So if you have some more, if you need this to, di to digest uh, for some time and then uh, follow up, uh, you can contact us and uh, we can um, uh, put you in touch with David or he can uh, answer the bundle of your questions. Um, with this, I want to thank you, David, for uh, uh, for sharing your experience and your knowledge. And I want to thank everybody for joining us for these more than two hours. Um, I think it was very interesting, and I hope you will be able to apply it in your businesses and your work. And I would like to say thank you again to Foundation 787 and Swiss EP and everybody involved for making this possible, because I know it takes a lot of organization behind the scenes. So congratulations for making it happen. Um, and I'm very pleased to participate and I hope we can do something similar again. And I'm looking forward to the, the questions, any follow-up questions and a continuing dialogue with, with yourselves and the participants today. Thank you. So for everybody who took part in this um, uh, webinar, we will be sharing follow-up email with a, a link of recording and some more materials that uh, David kindly provided. So you will hear from us. Have a great day, guys. Bye.